you think we should start? Get started. Okay, it's a terrible voice, but okay, it's. It is my great pleasure to introduce our third keynote speaker. Uh, Kamil Urbil is a professor of medicine, neurosciences, and radiology, and founding director of the Center for Magnetic Resonance Research at the University of Minnesota. After completing his undergraduate and PhD degrees in physics at Columbia University, Dr. Urbil joined AT&T Bell Labs and subsequently returned to Columbia as a faculty member in 1979. He then moved to University of Minnesota, where he founded the Center for Magnetic Resonance Research. Dr. Urville's research lab has been a world leader in developing techniques to obtain high-resolution, high-quality, functional, and anatomical images of the brain. Dr. Urville and his colleagues have pioneered many MR-based imaging techniques, including functional MRI and seven Tesla imaging, that have allowed scientists to study Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, and many other disorders. Dr. Urbil has received many honors and awards, including the Richard Ernst Medal, election to the National Academy of Medicine, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, National Academy of Inventors. Lately, Dr. Urbil has been busy as one of the copy eyes of the Human Connectome Project. Dr. Orville is one of the leaders of the international MR research community, which offers one of the most important imaging technologies we as the Mikai community rely on. We very much look forward to hearing Dr. Orville's speech today, as I'm sure it will inspire us all in many different ways. With that, I'd like to give Dr. Orville a warm welcome. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, introduction and also thank you uh, for the invitation to uh, come and deliver this lecture in, in Mikai. I've never attended this conference. Uh, many people, however, from my group attend uh, this conference every once, uh, uh, every once in a, year, a while. This year there aren't any, but uh, of course uh, it is I was excited when I heard that the conference was going to be in Istanbul. I uh, went to high school in Istanbul, and uh, uh, it's a great city. It is really unfortunate that uh, the events that has led to the cancellation of that uh, venue, as well as some of the events that have uh, taken place since then. But uh, uh, when I heard that the conference has moved to Athens, uh, I was uh, not disappointed. Uh, in fact, uh, I want to start by showing you this map of the Aegean. And uh, this is Istanbul right over here. And uh, as I said, I went to a high school there, but I'm actually from here. And my family, uh, my mother's maternal family, actually comes from the Greek island, uh, from uh, Lesbos. So um, in some ways, I should say I feel more Aegean than Turkish. You know? <laughs> And this is a beautiful uh, part of the world, and uh, I've been to Athens many times before. I have had uh, wonderful collaborations uh, in Greece, and, and I took the opportunity this time, and I said, okay, Athens, that's great. I flew to Samos, which is this island here, and uh, uh, sailed around these Dodecanese islands, uh, coming all the way to Kos from here. And they are really uh, beautiful islands. So I was in bays like this. Um, this is the boat that I was sailing. This is a, an island called Marathi. And uh, it has maybe about three buildings like this. Even given the fantastic ferry system of Greece, it would be hard to get to this place unless you rent a boat or charter a boat or something like this. Very, very few people, a lot of goats, <laughs> and uh, beautiful bays uh, like this. So, uh, and of course, Athens, um, fantastic uh, archaeological city. It's really a great pleasure uh, to be here. So thank you for the invitation and the opportunity. I can go on showing a lot of slides like this, of course. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I would be really happy. Uh, I love sailing in these waters, and I love swimming in these waters. I grew up in waters like this. And in fact, uh, the first time I went to New York, you know, to, as a student at Columbia University, I went to the 
Long Island, uh, I went to Long Island, the beach, and uh, everybody's very proud of Long Island and beach there, and I looked at the water, I said, no, I'm not going into that water. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, we're going to talk about science, and uh, I gave this title um, uh, for, for this uh, meeting, Advances in Diffusion Imaging in the Human Connectome Project. I mean, I, I gave that title because the people who come from my uh, group and my colleagues who come to this meeting are always diffusion imaging. They're interested in diffusion imaging. I thought, well, you know, there must be a large crowd of people interested in diffusion imaging. But uh, having actually uh, listened to uh, some of the lectures, uh, the, certainly the keynote lectures, and some of the philosophy uh, behind inviting the keynote speakers for this particular uh, meeting, I changed my title and my talk. And uh, instead, my new title is The Human Connectome Project and Few Other Things That May Be of Interest to Mikhail Attendees. Actually, I'm giving a talk on diffusion. Uh, well, I'm giving another talk tomorrow. There's a, um, you know, uh, um, satellite workshop, I suppose you can call it a satellite workshop, and I will focus mainly on diffusion imaging there, but I, I will talk a little bit about diffusion imaging, but I want to really focus on the Human Connectome Project because I think that uh, uh, from what I gather is that uh, your, you know, your interests and, and the interest uh, of many of you really, uh, it, should be, it would be interesting to hear about the Human Connectome Project. Human Connectome Project, you know, I think came to existence because I think there has been a realization, as we all know, that uh, brain disorders have become uh, the number one source of disability in the, in the United States and, and many other countries as well. I mean, we have had uh, many advances in uh, many other diseases, but uh, neuropsychiatric disorders, unfortunately, has not been, uh, have not been tractable. In fact, uh, to quote uh, Thomas Indel, who until very recently was the head of uh, National Institute of Mental Health at NIH, he said regarding these uh, brain disorders, the bottom line is the prevalence of such disorders has not decreased for any illness and mortality has not decreased for any illness. This is despite the fact that NIH annually invests something like seven to eight billion dollars of uh, uh, funding in neurosciences and brain disorders. I mean, we complain about uh, funding today uh, uh, from NIH, uh, but indeed, just for brain disorders and neuroscience, it's a significant amount. So, in addition to all this funding that is uh, uh, being invested, then there has been an effort at NIH and in the United States, really, to uh, initiate targeted projects like the Human Connectome Project, and uh, you've all heard of probably uh, the Obama Brain Initiative, uh, Brain Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies. So Human Connectome Project uh, is really, you can think of it as a big data project, and uh, uh, the aim was to generate a large and publicly available human brain imaging database, and that database is largely available right now and uh, it's still being added to uh, as, uh, as we wrap up the Human Connectome Project. And then, uh, um, you know, it was focused on human brain connectivity in a young, you know, ages 21 to 35, normative adult population. But this was a start, really, and it is now uh, expanding substantially. So here uh, uh, is the original Human Connectome Project, uh, the major grant that came to Washington University at the University of Minnesota Consortium, a smaller grant that went to uh, MGH UCLA Consortium. But now we are starting uh, three new human connectome projects. They're called Lifespan Human Connectome Projects, scanning babies, children, and adults, uh, targeting you know, uh, uh, aging in this case and development in these two cases. Uh, there are a lot of uh, hum human connectome related to disease these projects are being, these grants have been awarded to many different institutions, uh, not just uh, our consortium, which is going to be doing this, but, uh, you know, including epilepsy, anxiety, depression, Alzheimer's, blindness, et cetera, et cetera. There has been a developing uh, HCP separate grant in 2014, and now there's another big grant that is just uh, starting right now. It's called the ABCD, Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development 
And uh, this is not a human connectome project per se, but it's very much like the human connectome project and actually shares a lot of resources. And then all of these projects are coordinated through the human uh, connectome coordinating facility, which is run by WashU and University of Minnesota. So it is really expanding uh, um, as, as we speak into new avenues and NIH considers actually the Human Connectome Project so far uh, a major success as a result of which they're taking these new initiatives. So in the Human Connectome Project, the aim was really to obtain a description of functional and structural connections uh, among gray matter locations in the human brain in the millimeter scale or as good a resolution as we can obtain. And of course that meant uh, magnetic resonance imaging techniques because we are dealing with uh, human brain and we need non-invasive techniques and we are aiming for millimeter scale. And uh, so the magnetic resonance techniques that uh, play a predominant role in these, uh, uh, in, in the human connectome projects are based on functional imaging, namely monitoring of spontaneous fluctuations in an fMRI time series, so-called resting state fMRI, to deduce functional connectivity and diffusion weighted FM uh, MRI to infer structural connectivity. There's quite a lot of additional data in the Human Connectome Project. For example, there's a lot of morph morphological imaging, uh, task-based fMRI, uh, extensive phenotyping, and as we speak right now, we are completing the genotyping of all the uh, individuals, and that will be also made available as soon as uh, it, it, is, uh, it is finished. Just to give you an idea, uh, so each individual in the uh, Human Connectome Project was scanned for four uh, hours four sessions, one, uh, each uh, one hour long. So there were uh, resting state fMRI, as I had mentioned, uh, one hour long, four 15 minute uh, sessions, one hour of task fMRI, various tasks to identify uh, various regions of the brain, and then uh, one hour of diffusion weighted MRI, I mean broken up into uh, six 10 minute runs. So uh, for a single subject, the compressed nifty formatted uh, unprocessed data is around uh, 10 gigabytes and for, uh, pre uh, for the pre-processed data ends up at uh, uh, 30 gigabytes. So actually if you want to get 1,200 uh, of these data, it's a pretty big data uh, set that uh, we tend to actually do that by, uh, you know, we call it connectome in a box, you know, you get uh, a lot of data shipped to you in a box. There was a, uh, for those of you who may be interested, uh, we just published recently a review article that actually outlines uh, some of the um, uh, background of why we dis did what we did and how we collected the data and uh, the approach that we uh, came to. Now, uh, the Human Connectome Project had two phases. Uh, phase one, development and optimization of tools and phase two was to generate this database. 1,200 subject database uh, using twins and their non-twin siblings. And that data was collected at three Tesla, a unique three Tesla in instrument, I should say. And then 200 of those subjects, we couldn't quite reach 200, unfortunately, but 180 of them uh, were actually, uh, this was uh, the three Tesla subjects, by the way, uh, were from the uh, St. Louis area from the um, uh, Missouri twin uh, database. And we flew 180 of them to Minneapolis and we scanned them uh, at seven Tesla. Now I wanted to emphasize the fact that uh, uh, this point, namely phase one, that unlike many uh, projects, like there are other uh, similar data projects where people are collecting a lot of imaging data, for example, ADNI focused on uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease. Unlike uh, ADNI and other uh, projects, Actually, the Human Connectome Project had about two years invested in tool development. So I thought I would mention that because uh, the keynote uh, talks in this meeting have been very much focused on tools, and indeed, uh, tools are very important. And in fact, that was, this was realized in the Human Connectome uh, Project. And uh, essentially, I thought, uh, uh, I want to emphasize the importance of the tools by, uh, many of you may have seen this, reminding you of this quote from uh, Freeman Dyson, who's a theoretical physicist and mathematician at Princeton, who said in uh, lectures, these are published lectures, he said, new directions in science are launched by new tools much more often than uh, by new concepts. And that is certainly the case in the brain. I mean, after all, uh, we have today a neuron hypothesis of the brain. We have learned a lot, starting uh, by Ramon y Cajal, 
who uh, was able to obtain these fantastic drawings uh, of the brain and showing us uh, neurons and that the fact that these are connected cells and they actually project long distances. And he was able to do that because of the uh, discovery of the microscope that has enabled him uh, to do this. And uh, so in the Human Connectome Project, we are in fact uh, looking at mapping connectivity and uh, activity in the millimeter scale. These are actually human connectome data. But uh, in fact, uh, with the hum you know, Obama Brain Initiative, uh, the philosophy is that uh, we are one day going to be able to bridge the scales from here all the way to you know, activity of single neurons, albeit not with the same techniques, not necessarily in the same species, or to connectivity, synapse by synapse connectivity. I mean, there are efforts already, people trying to uh, uh, actually obtain by synapse by synapse connectivity in organisms li like, like a mouse using electron microscopy. So these are really, in, uh, in my mind, uh, really exciting times for uh, brain research. And in fact, in my lab, you know, we are very much focused in bridge bridging this gap in terms of activity and the uh, Human Connectome Project was uh, a natural project for us to, uh, to get involved in. Human Connectome Project is also a team uh, science. It involves uh, um, uh, several institutions. Uh, primary institutions in our consortium are the Washington University, University of Minnesota, and University of Oxford in the, in the UK. It's a photograph taken in one of our so-called all-hands meeting um, in uh, 2013. So we had uh, 101 people on, on that team at that time. And especially in this photograph, I want to um, uh, mention uh, David Van Essen, who's my uh, co-principal uh, investigator in this project. But there are other universities uh, listed over here besides the, the three primary that have taken place. So uh, the, the reason that this uh, kind of uh, tr uh, three-way collaboration evolved is that you know, we, were, we really had complementary uh, talents and, uh, and expertise. So uh, Uni University of Minnesota, CMRR, we were responsible for development uh, of hardware, uh, pulse sequences, and image reconstruction uh, algorithms. And um, a very large group of people uh, from, uh, from that uh, uh, from that lab. Oxford was uh, responsible uh, for data cleanup and analysis, uh, and they've also been putting out these uh, tools online as we are putting out uh, these hardware and, I mean, pulse sequences online uh, available. And WashU was in, uh, uh, responsible for data analysis, also visualization and dissemination. So uh, really a, a very uh, complementary team of uh, investigators. So let me come back to uh, some of the tools again that uh, we are using in, uh, in the Human co uh, Connectome Project. As I had mentioned, one of the techniques, in fact, the one that has been producing most of the results uh, so far, and I will talk about that uh, more than uh, the other one, which is diffusion imaging, is the so-called resting state, uh, uh, resting state um, fMRIs. And if you look at an fMRI time series, so fMRI experiment is a very simple experiment, actually. You are collecting one image after another very rapidly for quite a long time. And if you look at an fMRI time series, sorry, uh, if I can go back. fMRI time series, you see that uh, uh, in something like in three different regions, uh, the fluctuations are correlated. And if you ma make a map of these uh, spontaneous uh, fluctuations, you get something like this. So it looks like a functional image, but it is not. It's really a spatial pattern of correlated temporal dynamics uh, res resembling activation maps. And the other technology, as I mentioned, is diffusion imaging. It produces uh, tractography results like this. And um, as I will show you, actually, probably, uh, I mean, there are a lot of issues uh, with both techniques, but uh, the data, as I will show you, from Human Connectome Project so far, maybe one of the best, well, okay, I would say the best <laughs> uh, type of data available for this kind of uh, technique. So the idea is that uh, then if you look at these uh, data, either uh, resting state uh, functional data or diffusion data, and you correlate um, you know, one each voxel in the image with every other voxel, you end up with a matrix like this, uh, which we tend to refer to as a dense, dense connectome, 
And that connect, you know, for functional data, this matrix represents correlation of spontaneous fluctuations between each voxel and every other voxel. For diffusion imaging, it, it represents probability of connections uh, in, this, uh, in this particular uh, matrix. And, uh, you know, sometimes people analyze this, as I will show you, uh, not in this format, because this is a very large matrix, and they tend to parcelate it and reduce it somehow and you end up with uh, not this kind of a dense connectome, but parcellated connectomes. So challenges in the human connectome uh, was, you know, we wanted to get to high spatial resolution over the, over the whole brain, so that's a, a challenge. We had to maximize signal-to-noise ratio, and uh, we had to have, uh, uh, because we were going to cover a much larger volume than just looking at a single, uh, some section of the brain in a low resolution, we had to go much faster and uh, without sacrificing SNR. And uh, essentially, uh, the challenge comes from the fact that there's always a trade-off between spatial resolution and temporal sampling range uh, in imaging. So for example, in MR imaging of the brain, we tend to, you know, for this kind of connectomics data, we tend to acquire uh, data in multiple slices, and uh, the time it takes you uh, to cover the whole brain depends on your resolution because that, depend, uh, that depends on the num uh, that determines the number of slices you need to cover the whole brain. So higher resolution means more slices needed to cover the whole brain and then you have a longer TR, TR being the time needed to cover the volume of interest which in this case was a whole brain including cerebellum etc. So there's this trade-off um, and uh, you can go up and down this uh, curve here you know, if you want higher resolution, uh, temporal sampling rate, rate goes down, etc. But uh, for reasons that we were, you know, as you had heard, that you know, we we push high fields because of we, our interest in high resolution imaging, and in high resolution imaging we were confronted with this to begin with, and then uh, when the human connectome uh, project came into existence, the techniques that we were developing to tackle this challenge, you know, really found its uh, 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 footing. And uh, we were able to actually shift that curve by uh, using uh, a method that is often referred to as multiband or simultaneous uh, multi-slice uh, acquisition. So uh, as I had mentioned, uh, typically then when we're covering a whole brain, we go one slice at a time and the number of slices times the time per slice determines your uh, volume coverage. But in this technique, uh, you excite multiple slices at the same time and you actually then use the information that is uh, inherent in your uh, detection system, and the detection system has to have uh, many uh, detecting coils uh, to actually recover and unalias those, uh, those data. For example, if you look at uh, slices like this, they will be very sensitively detected by these uh, detectors uh, uh, here, but not so much by these and vice versa for a slice like that, and that particular information is used to unalias these uh, slices. So you can gain a major acceleration. For example, uh, here is a, an image, uh, so it's called, in this case, labeled multiband one. That would be a regular image you would get uh, using this technique EPI, which is used uh, a lot for uh, functional imaging and diffusion imaging, and four slices. And this is uh, when you are exciting eight slices at the same time, and uh, you can see that uh, you can actually achieve, and this is all data, by the way, things are now improving, improved quite a bit since then, but uh, you, know, you can actually achieve uh, eightfold acceleration easily, and in fact, human connectome data, the resting state data is acquired with uh, eightfold acceleration. You can go higher, um, you know, 12 fold, not bad, 16 fold, it starts uh, failing, and uh, you can evaluate you know, how good you are doing uh, uh, quantitatively, for example, uh, something called looking at, you know, signals from one slice leaking into other slices, you can quantitate that. So in this case, for example, uh, if you look at uh, exciting three slices at the same time, uh, you know, you, you do very well. This is the slice leaking into others. No, it's not leaking very much, as you can see from this image. As I said, you can quantify it. Multiband factor four, very good. Eight, there is some leakage. Uh, but uh, tolerable, and of course, uh, 12, you can start seeing it uh, increasing. As I said, these are uh, from the very beginning of the human connectome data, piloting data, and things have improved uh, quite a bit since then. 
uh, but um, human connectome data for resting state, for example, was acquired with multiband aid. So resting state data uh, achieved actually resolutions at three Tesla, which were you know, much more advanced compared to what was available at the time. And uh, we were able to, for example, get uh, two millimeter isotropic resolution, whereas you know, most of the uh, data of that time was three to four millimeter, and people actually needed to smooth that data quite a bit to get something uh, out of it. And uh, uh, we can do it with two millimeter without smoothing. And we did multiband eight, you know, factor of eight acceleration and data acquisition, which allowed us to acquire the whole image for the brain in uh, less than a second, 0.7 seconds. So otherwise, we would have done something like point, you know, 5.6, 5.8 seconds. And uh, as I had mentioned, uh, there were four times 15 minute acquisition. And this rapid sampling rate indeed has um, advantages uh, in resting state fMRI. And for example, it can be shown here, uh, it can be seen here, this is uh, some of these spontaneous fluctuations detected um, in the primary visual uh, areas and in the motor cortex, uh, sensory motor cortex areas. Uh, using the standard acquisition, TR of 5.8, and uh, this is uh, eight-fold acceleration, and you can see that the statistical significance actually increases uh, substantially, but not only that, you know, for example, you can see there's a hint of these supplementary motor areas. We know that there are supplementary motor areas here. You can actually detect them uh, now much better uh, in this particular accelerated imaging. So there are many ways you can uh, analyze uh, um, resting state data, you know, and our Oxford colleagues tend to prefer uh, ICA analysis. And uh, one of the things that they realized uh, very quickly was that with this uh, advanced acquisition, you can actually uh, get um, high dimensional ICA uh, analysis. So previously, uh, compared to previous uh, uh, analysis, they were able to classify, for example, 200 components as being uh, real uh, data. And then in addition, when you looked at these data uh, in uh, greater detail, like these images, instead of seeing these big blobs of correlated activity, you, you in fact see much finer grained activity, which you can then uh, cluster uh, hierarchically as, as shown over here. And human connectome data not only has resting state, fMRI, but as you've seen, uh, as you've heard, it also has functional imaging. So you can actually compare some of these uh, results. So this is the ICA analysis from resting state. Remember, the subjects are just sitting there four times 15 minute data acquisition. And then you get this ICA component. Um, you know, this is component number eight. And uh, to people who know something about brain activity, this looks like um, some sort of a motor activity, uh, hand or mouth or foot or something like this. And when we looked at actually act, uh, activation patterns then, um, from the task fMRI, now in this case the subject is actually moving their hand, this is a left hand movement, this is task fMRI, you can see that there is excellent correlation uh, between those uh, two images, and uh, since this is a task fMRI and uh, we ascri ascribe these to networks involved in um, hand movement and you know, there's uh, laterality in, in motor activity, we can go, back, go and look at, for example, uh, another ICA component, which looks like maybe the other hand, and in fact, uh, now uh, right hand movement, uh, you can actually see that that also corresponds very nicely. Of course, when you have very complex tasks, you know, so I don't know, memory, recovery, and navigation, or something like this, uh, you will not get necessarily a very, very good correspondence between uh, these ICA uh, components and what is activated, but presumably several of those ICA components may in fact then act, you know, uh, resemble uh, or produce what is act, you know, seen in, in, a, in the task fMRI as well. But essentially this type of data indeed uh, gives you confidence, quite a bit of confidence, showing that uh, resting state fluctuations somehow tell you something about networks uh, in the brain and that regions which are correlated together, I mean, uh, uh, net, uh, are, are involved in, uh, uh, in networks. There's already been uh, quite a bit of analysis of the data. I, uh, I, I don't have time to summarize it all, but some of the results, for example, very early analysis on uh, something like uh, 25 subjects, I believe, um, um, and uh, yeah, twins. And uh, uh, so looking at 
uh, monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins and then uh, uh, 71 non-twin siblings, uh, which is a different data set, not the human connectome data set, but uh, the dizygotic and monozygotic twins are uh, from the human connectome data set. You know, you are able to uh, tell them apart. But more recently, for example, this is uh, work primarily coming from uh, our human connectome um, uh, consortium, but coming from uh, our uh, Oxford colleague. And they, they were able to show that uh, when you look at correlations between subject measures, which were uh, extensively uh, uh, acquired in, in the pre-scanning uh, uh, sessions, you can actually have this, you know, these uh, uh, subject measures such as, you know, uh, fluid intelligence, number of correct responses versus fluid intelligence, number of skip responses, uh, drug tests, years of education, life satisfaction, etc. You can actually have a hierarchy of these, and they correlate very nicely with the, uh, the resting state network. It's an example of the fluid intelligence. Each of these dots is a single subject. This is a 416 subject uh, analysis. And you can see that there's a uh, for, you know, you know, very good correlation between the connectomes, this is the imaging data, versus the subject measures um, uh, that were obtained. More recently, um, there's, there's been a paper by uh, Finn et al. from the Yale group, and they looking at the human connectome data. They were able to show that functional connectome uh, they, the paper is titled Functional Connectome Fingerprinting, Identifying Individuals Using Pattern of Brain Activity, uh, Connectivity. Essentially, they were able to actually, in the human connectome data, identify um, single individuals from the data itself. Another example here uh, coming from uh, our UK colleagues, uh, Oxford, and they were able to show that the task-free fMRI, so-called resting state fMRI, predicts actually individual differences in brain activity. So they were able to actually use the task-free fMRI data to predict how that subject is going to respond uh, uh, during a task in terms of uh, brain activity, which is very consistent with what I was showing you all earlier, that uh, task activity and uh, brain uh, uh, correlated activity actually are uh, very uh, nicely congruent with each other. and. Uh, uh, more, you know, another paper in 2005. This is actually from the Allen Institute, and they were uh, looking at, uh, they were fo focusing on genetic uh, signatures in adult human brain, and uh, at the end, uh, they, you know, they looked at how the genetic signatures and expression of genes corresponded to some of the human connectome data, and they were able to, they were not on the same individuals now, you have to realize, but this will be feasible on the same population, and they were able to report a uh, highly consistent transcriptional architecture in neocortex is correlated with resting state functional connectivity, suggesting a link between conserved gene expression and functional irrelevant circuitry. And of course, with the availability of the uh, genetic data that will be coming soon, uh, this type of analysis uh, will be highly facilitated. And another very recent paper from our consortium, the brain redefined, it made the <laughs> nature of uh, the cover of Nature, and of course a little bit of a hype by them uh, on the cover, the brain we define, uh, you know, it's uh, essentially this parcellation techniques that we were able to use, uh, primarily led by Washington University colleagues, um, uh, able to use uh, the, the multitudes of data in the Human Connectome uh, Project to come, come up with a new parcellation. Of course, you know, this is 180 uh, uh, distinct brain regions that were identified in this effort. But of course, ultimately in the brain, there are many, many more regions, but this is, you can regard it as a first uh, best approximation if you like. So coming back to the dense connectome, uh, you know, these parcellation techniques, as I mentioned, uh, are used to get these parcellated connectomes. And some of the data that I showed you, the results, you know, for example, subject measures correlating with uh, uh, connectivity, they were done on parcellated connectomes. But you can look at, uh, um, uh, the dense connectome, you know, uh, as well, um, although somewhat difficult to do a lot of analysis on it at the present time, but I think in the future that will not be the case. But for example, you know, this is a single point uh, in, the, in the brain and looking at correlations uh, of this individual's brain for, the, for this point, uh, how um, it's a representation of the dense connectome, if you like, uh, in the brain space 
and if you move to another point, that is another line in that matrix, and you get uh, something, uh, something different. But one of the advantages that uh, we had, uh, because we were acquiring this data so fast, was to look at the dynamics uh, of this. Now, these, are, uh, uh, these networks are not um, s you know, uh, stationary. They do fluctuate quite a bit. There's a lot of interest in that. And the kind of methods that we developed in the Human Connectome Project was uh, very helpful for this kind of uh, um, uh, analysis. So if you think of some networks, for example, you know, uh, a network of you know, five nodes here, and um, it's possible that uh, in the brain, what is really happening is that you have uh, sometimes these, uh, you know, three, three of them here, one, two, three of the nodes are correlated, and at other, you know, and the five and four correlated. At other, other times, you have, you know, five and two and three are correlated, and together you get uh, this sort of so-called resting state network uh, approximation of, of the brain. And, and uh, we were able to show that we can actually look at the dynamics of that uh, using now temporal ICA. And essentially uh, what you are seeing here is that some of these regions are popping up in different colors. For example, if you focus right over here, this region shows up sometimes red and sometimes green and sometimes blue, all of which are these different networks and saying that, you know, capturing the ability of this region to participate in these various different uh, uh, networks. Now, coming to diffusion MR, um, uh, I, you know, diffusion MR data is really quite excellent in the Human Connectome Project because of uh, not only this, uh, uh, you know, accelerated imaging uh, that we were able to implement, but also there was an instrumental improvement. So when you are doing diffusion MR, you actually, uh, these buttons are very close, I have to pay very close attention to them so that, uh, okay, so when you do diffusion MR, this is a, a sort of a, a cartoon representation of what you are doing. You excite the signals, you turn on a gradient uh, to encode uh, some diffusion, uh, you know, uh, ev ev evolution, you, do another refocusing RF pulse, and then in this refocusing RF pulse, the paths have to be retracted, I mean, re rewound essentially uh, in the presence of this gradient. And if spins are stationary, they are rewound, and you see those. But if they are diffusing, the paths that are uh, covered in the you know, frequency space here is not the same as here, and so you are sensitive to diffusion imaging. And in the meantime, when you are doing this, the signal is decreasing uh, exponentially uh, according to this equation, uh, depending on this uh, period. There's a decay constant T2. And uh, so, uh, in fact, you lose signal in diffusion imaging while you are doing the diffusion encoding. And this is a very uh, serious problem in diffusion imaging. But uh, in the Human Connectome Project, in our um, uh, consortium, uh, you know, we were able to get new gradients. So this was a three Tesla with a new gradients operating at 100 millitesla per meter so that we can actually uh, squeeze this TE to show in, uh, these diffusion gradients to show that. What is important is the area underneath these uh, gradients, not how, how big and how long they are. And uh, it's not 100% correct when you get the very, very, very short ones, but uh, in the region that in the, uh, we are operating, uh, the area is the important one. And uh, so you can then shorten your TE and gain signal to noise. So we were operating at 100 millitesla per meter, and of course, I had mentioned that there was a smaller uh, 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 human connectome project grant given to MGH and UCLA colleagues, and they, that was a much more focused one. They didn't generate such a big data set, et cetera, but they actually were interested in developing an instrument with a 300 millitesla per meter gradients. And uh, that is also now an instrument that is available, and there's some data available from that instrument as well. But this is the uh, instrument that we used, and of course, you can buy an instrument today, a commercial instrument that comes close to this, uh, but not exactly uh, to this one. So this is some diffusion data, and uh, when we started uh, this development, for example, typically people were using uh, three Tesla scanners with 40 millitesla per meter gradient sets, and uh, uh, and if you you know the advanced sites were brave enough to go to two millimeter isotropic resolution with multi-channel coils, 
So this is a, uh, without any diffusion weighting or minimal diffusion weighting, and then these are, uh, as you increase the diffusion weighting, as you can see, uh, the signal uh, actually drops out, not only encodes for diffusion, but we are losing sig signal to noise. And now this is the human connectome data. We are one fourth the voxel volume. We are at higher resolution. This is two millimeter isotropic. Human connectome data is 1.25 millimeter isotropic. So in principle, uh, relative to this, we have lost uh, one fourth uh, the signal from the voxel, but because we have these shorter uh, TEs, uh, delay times, we can gain, and this, you can see that uh, this is actually better signal to noise at a higher resolution compared to what was the standard at that time. So the data in the human connectome project is acquired uh, with multiband factor of three. You may be asking why not higher? You run into, when you are doing diffusion imaging, uh, you run into limitations due to power deposition and things like that, um, which are now problems uh, that are solved, but uh, at that time uh, um, we were limited to multiband uh, three. For example, in the lifespan, diffusion imaging data will be acquired with either multiband four or five, uh, for example, for diffusion imaging. But 1.25 millimeter nominal resolution, uh, three shells, uh, for those of you who are into diffusion imaging, who may know anything, you know, diffusion imaging weighting uh, was 1,000, 2,000, and 3,000, and a lot of different directions, 270 non-collinear uh, directions. So very nice data. So you can actually see this is what it looks like typically. This is fractional anisotropy for each image. Uh, two and a half millimeter ISO, uh, resolution, and this is 1.25 millimeter resolution. And it does have an impact, a major impact. So these are some probabilistic tractography uh, uh, from the human connectome data with two millimeter resolution. Essentially, you put seeds in the cortex. Uh, these are uh, corticothalamic tracts and uh, corticobulbar, corticospinal, and corticostriatal projections. And those projections, these are known projections, they're supposed to go through this particular slice. They're supposed to traverse through this uh, slice uh, where those, in a well-organized fashion, uh, indicated by those green arrows here. So you kind of see them, yes, they are there, but there's also a lot of false positive, as you can see, in this uh, typical diffusion imaging data. Um, and uh, this is the human connectome data at 1.25 millimeter resolution. So the significant improvements uh, uh, coming from uh, the, the, you know, uh, higher sampling of Q-space uh, diffusion weighting orientations and high, high resolution. Here's another example. This was an example from Johannes Klein in the University of Frankfurt, who has, he, to, he said that he's always been interested in these two uh, tracks uh, from uh, pulvinar connectivity, and he's always had very difficulty in extracting these uh, tracks. These are probabilistic uh, uh, tractography again, and uh, so these tracks come out of the pulvinar and then they they kind of twist around uh, each other, and then one goes to the uh, frontal cortex and the other one uh, to the visual areas, and, as, uh, and he was able to resolve them uh, in the human connectome, uh, from the human connectome data. And of course, ultimately, we are very much interested in how the diffusion data correlates with uh, the resting state data. Um, there isn't a lot of super detailed analysis on that, but uh, this is an early uh, analysis on a few subjects so in this case, here, uh, here's a seed. Uh, this is structural connectivity, probabilistic connectivity. So you are looking at essentially the probability of connection. So if you look, uh, this is the dense, uh, dense connectome represented on the uh, cortical surface uh, from this particular seed. It projects to these parietal areas and temporal areas and a lot of connections in the language areas over here. And this is a group average of nine subjects, uh, you know, showing the similar pattern of a single subject. Uh, and then uh, when you compare that, this is the structural connectivity I was showing from this area, from resting state connectivity. You can see there are very similar patterns. They're not identical. You don't expect them to be identical because these are point-to-point -point connections. Uh, these actually are not necessarily point-to-point -point connections. And uh, so you should expect to see what you see here over here uh, but you can expect to see more in this kind of data, and this is exactly the case. This is another example um, uh, I, you know, from several subjects from the data. In this case, um, 
uh, saw Jawabdi at Oxford, uh, uh, what he has done is uh, he put a region of interest here. This is uh, approximately where the arcuate fasciculus goes through. These are bundles of connections that uh, are very important in language uh, areas in the brain. And uh, uh, he then got tracks that come from that uh, as uh, shown over here. So these are all the tracks that are coming and going through that region of interest and they go as uh, arcuate fasciculus should to frontal areas and the uh, uh, areas in the cortex. And then from the resting state data, we can actually then put a seed in the language area, the Broca's area, and see uh, what are the, uh, the sc correlated spontaneous fluctuations are, and they are uh, in excellent agreement, as you can see over here. The seed is somewhere over here, Broca's area, and these are the language areas coming from the, uh, from, uh, from the resting state data. Now, I had mentioned to you that human connectome is not just three Tesla, it has a seven Tesla component. I'll show you a little bit about that. Uh, um, and uh, in the seven Tesla, uh, we are, as you've heard, that we are really, uh, my lab has really pushed high fields and uh, we were the very first ones to do seven Tesla to really improve and our rationale was to improve fMRI detection. So in fMRI, uh, increasing, you know, a lot of work that we, carried out using uh, animal systems and high field magnets and then later on uh, uh, human systems uh, at high field magnets. We were able to demonstrate that in fMRI, increasing magnetic fields provide major advantages. For example, you have higher spatial fidelity uh, between functional imaging signals and underlying neuronal activity. You have to remember that functional imaging signals are not direct signals of activity. You have the neurovascular coupling in between and of course, uh, the physics of how you detect the uh, consequences of neurovascular coupling. And uh, it turns out that magnetic field magnitude plays a really important role. And uh, so part of the tool development, if you like, uh, in, in our lab and, uh, and now more and more in other labs have been to push uh, high magnetic fields. So for functional imaging, it has been really fantastic uh, uh, and uh, you also get, it turns out, increased signal-to-noise uh, ratio, which uh, means that you get functional contrast, uh, increased functional contrast in nature for, uh, for functional imaging. Let me, you know, just uh, digressing a little bit from Human Connectome Project, show you what we were able to do by pushing uh, seven Tesla and, and, and beyond, actually. The, today we are working on 10 and a half Tesla. But when seven Tesla, you know, we work a lot on the auditory cortex, when seven Tesla came into existence and we were able to obtain finally fMRI signals from it, and uh, um, it took us a while, you know, we couldn't buy a seven Tesla equipment at the time, you know, we actually bought a magnet, uh, bought a lot of parts and bits and pieces, we put it together as sort of a Lego fMRI, and as imperfect as it was compared to what you can buy commercially today, we were able to obtain, uh, for the first time, tonotopic maps in the primary auditory cortex right here. This was known in the, uh, in the animal liter literature that the tonotopic maps in the auditory, primary auditory cortex are, are mirror symmetric, but we were, nobody was able to show it in the human, uh, uh, at the time, in the human brain, and seven tests that the first uh, application was to be able to show this mirror symmetric uh, tonotopic maps. But today, uh, for example, in 2013, we published a paper showing that the tonotopic maps, not only you can obtain in the uh, primary auditory cortex, but you can also obtain it in the you know, inferior colliculus, much, much smaller uh, uh, system coming, you know, something you cannot really do at three Tesla, today at least. And uh, more recently, Michel Morel uh, was uh, in CMRR, was able to show that you can obtain uh, tonotopic maps in the medial geniculate bodies. These are small uh, sub, you know, cortical nuclei uh, in this path coming from the, uh, you know, the from the ear. Uh, here's the inferior colliculus, and here's the uh, medial geniculate body, and then going to the primary cortex. And there are two such maps we were able to show. And uh, interestingly, this map was obtained by, of course, having the subjects listen to tones, you know, one tone after another. These maps were obtained subjects just listening to natural sounds, you know, bells ringing and uh, etc. 
which is a you know uh, an, another advance that seven Tesla has uh, has really enabled. Uh, um, and finally, uh, more recently, we published this paper, 2015, not only going back to uh, <laughs> going back to the primary auditory cortex. Not only we can map these with uh, enough resolution to see the mirror symmetry, but we can map them to see how they vary across the cortex. Remember, the cortical gray matter is a few millimeters thick, and there's a distribution of different cell types, and uh, there's a circuitry across that uh, cortical layer. And this is of uh, great interest, you know, because the connections uh, from different uh, layers are, they go to different uh, areas of the brain, and uh, the cell types, there are six different neuronal cell types across this uh, cortical layer. So we were able to obtain that, again, really only high, uh, high field uh, is able to uh, allow us to do that and show, for example, that when subjects are paying attention to the auditory tunes versus paying attention to a visual process while the sounds are being played, you have a different across the layer difference in uh, responses and in the differences biggest in the outer layers. And uh, the significance of this is essentially as I had mentioned, the connections across the brain is layer dependent and cortical connections can come to outer layer and modulate the uh, essentially processing of the primary input. Um, and similar data was obtained uh, in the visual cortex. Really exciting data that is possible from seven Tesla. Just to give you what was possible uh, by going to high magnetic field and functional imaging. We expect these gains to carry to the human connectome project as well, and so we did uh, uh, collect 180 subjects. This is from our piloting data. Uh, this is a single, same subject, uh, scanned at three Tesla. This is our standard. So this is, you know, when, what the data looks like without all that smoothing and etc. cetera and, uh, representation, but this is the real data, if you like. And this is what the seven Tesla data looks like for the individual areas. Really very nicely, for example, you can see the activity following the cortical ribbon here uh, and uh, much more extensive as well. Um, there's been quite a bit of uh, push and pull. Uh, I don't have time to go into the details uh, in terms of where do we scan, uh, uh, where do we set the parameters, but ultimately uh, uh, we didn't go to this higher resolution. This is 1.25 millimeter isotropic. We ended up with uh, 1.6 millimeter isotropic uh, resolution, the, which is still a factor of two better in volume uh, than the 3T data. But here's, uh, now we have subjects both at 3T and 7T, and we can compare them. So this is an initial, uh, just recent, recently, I think it's probably appeared already uh, as an early uh, publication. But um, anyway, it's in press, uh, data showing an analysis on 24 subjects showing that uh, number of ICA components that you can pull from the resting state data much higher on the 7T than the 3T, despite the fact that we have uh, higher resolution in the 7T data. And uh, contrast the noise, uh, essentially uh, defined as uh, the variance you can explain for bold versus unstructured noise. And uh, again, um, better than factor of two improvement at seven Tesla. So, this, is, uh, this has major consequences. For example, here is um, uh, seven Tesla versus three, uh, three Tesla contrast the noise represented on the surface of the brain and in the subcortical structures in this particular scale going from zero to one. This is three Tesla and this is seven Tesla. So you can see that there's a significant improvement as shown in the uh, previous bar graphs and uh, uh, for example, this is uh, the dense connectivity from a subcortical nucleus, in this case uh, here, um, a, you know, pulvinar connectivity. So you, have a, you put a uh, seed point here and you ask uh, where are these, where is the seed point connected? Uh, in other words, where does it show correlated activity? This is the three Tesla data and it really looks like noise. I mean, so it's not a very good uh, extraction in this case, you probably get, you will get much better if you do a lot of subjects averaging, etc. But this is the uh, seven Tesla data. Now you can see it really very nicely on the cortex as well into the connections to the subcortical structures. 
So these are gradients in this uh, connectivity map. Three Tesla, the gradients are important. They are the ones who define these parcellations quite often. And uh, these are the gradients of that uh, connectivity uh, map that I just showed you at uh, three Tesla and at seven Tesla, much better defined in other areas, etc. So the seven Tesla data, uh, oh, and one other point, you know, consistency. So we were able to look at the consistency between three Tesla and three Tesla, seven Tesla and seven Tesla runs. I won't go into the detail about how we did it, but here uh, is the uh, three Tesla to three Tesla consistency, and this is uh, for seven Tesla. Again, you know, showing that the rep repeatability of these results are much better, you know, based on the fact that, of course, you know, contrast and noise and signal noise is much better at seven Tesla. So a lot of the analysis of the data that I showed you are coming from 3T, but uh, um, at, at, um, uh, there will be 7T data uh, available soon. Already we've released 70 of them, and soon uh, uh, there will be uh, some more at uh, uh, 7 Tesla. I think will be very interesting as well in terms of what we can learn. Now, I won't talk about 7T diffusion. I'll s I save that for uh, tomorrow. But uh, uh, just to give you a teaser, if you are interested in coming to the lecture tomorrow, I mean, seven, uh, resting state fMRI, there are major gains for 7 Tesla, but not so necessarily for uh, diffusion. We have some gains, we have some disadvantages. Nonetheless, we can obtain some uh, very interesting uh, diffusion data, and I will talk about uh, that in more technical detail uh, tomorrow. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will stop here. Thank you very much for this fantastic talk on these most advanced uh, MR imaging techniques. Now we can take questions. Okay, thank you very much for uh, this fantastic talk and also for stressing the importance of tools. I'm sure this community uh, appreciates that. Um, could you say a word about the possible complementary uh, human brain project in Europe? the idea of trying to simulate, in fact, the activity of the, of the brain. Yes, I mean, I, yeah, the Human Brain Project in Europe, I guess it is best uh, maybe compared to the Obama Brain Project, but the philosophically they are very different projects and they are really complementary. So in the Obama Brain Project, uh, the idea was, okay, uh, we don't know enough about the brain, uh, so let's dig down and uh, have targeted grants that actually ask uh, um, more questions, I mean, or an seek answers uh, about uh, brain. For example, you know, um, cell types. You know, we have, uh, we know some cell types in the brain, but some people think that there may be as uh, much as uh, 70 different cell types if you actually use uh, genetic markers to differentiate uh, cell types. So let's find out all the cell types. And uh, let's find out, uh, let's, let's, map activity uh, in the brain. Today, you know, you can map activity in the brain uh, with, for example, uh, two photon techniques. I don't know, maybe 1,000 neurons invasive. Well, let's map one million neurons. Uh, this kind of a very data-driven uh, 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 approach. Data-driven approach. And, uh, and also some new uh, focus on uh, developing new imaging techniques, etc. Whereas the Human Brain Project in Europe um, has a very different, uh, uh, and it has some of this uh, um, uh, approach, but also they want to simulate, essentially. Um, and in some sense, that's also very interesting. And in fact, there's always an interface. I think we're gonna see more and more, for example, methods that are coming from artificial intelligence telling, informing us about the brain and vice versa. This is already going on. And uh, a little bit the Human Brain, uh, Human Brain Project in Europe is focusing in that uh, area. Now you can say, you know, we can um, um, build, let's say uh, we build a computer and you know, you turn on the computer and then the computer s speaks German, for example, and asks for a beer. Okay, this is very interesting, obviously, fantastic. We need to understand, uh, uh, you know, how this happened, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the brain. You know, it's, you know it may be a different solution uh, than the brain. So, but the two techniques are very informative, and at some point, uh, I think uh, uh, they will merge 
and inform us quite a bit. First, I would like to thank you for a great talk, despite not being in Istanbul. Thank you very much. Um, actually, my question is perhaps a comment. I mean, there is a, a great initiative at the moment to uh, collect very large data sets, which are very high quality, very specific, but they will never be as large as what you can collect from the hospitals. Uh, so on the other hand, there is now as well activities about trying to bring all of those data together, and they will be low quality, but high numbers. Uh, so do you think there is a way of, of um, uh, improving even further the data set by including uh, large scale image information coming from um, hospitals? Yeah, this is always, of course, uh, a conflict. Um, you know, when you have a human connect on project like data set, which is not huge, um, as, as you point out, but very targeted and very, very well controlled and uh, tools and uh, uh, how you process the data, extremely well controlled, very informative compared to what comes from patients over many hospitals, over many countries. And, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, something, I don't know, this dichotomy will always uh, exist. And I think that um, pot potentially, you know, as some of these tools that, for example, that come from targeted efforts like uh, Human Connectome Project become available in commercial machines, you know, some of that data will also improve at the same time. And I think that there will be, you know, always there's a diff there will be a difference. And then when you analyze data, you know, you'll have to take into account these, um, the fact that the hospital data is much more varied, et cetera. But hopefully the hospital data quality will also increase and there will be some more uniformity that will be improving that uh, data sets as well. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, you started your talk by, by mentioning the important problem of uh, neuropsychiatric disorders. And then you showed us a bit of a shift between your title and what you showed us, and you showed us a lot more of uh, functional uh, magnetic resonance imaging. So um, especially in this committee, it has the reputation of being noise. Uh, but I'd like to, to hear your thoughts about if we want to address the, the problems of brain function, which are neuropsychiatric disorders, what do you think is in the future, the role to play of F fMRI, basically functional imaging versus anatomical imaging? Versus? Anatomical imaging, structural. I think that, you know, first of all, um, they are both important, clearly. Um, but if you look at just anatomical images of, you know, neuropsychiatric disorders, uh, you really see nothing, right? I mean, you, if there's a brain tumor, okay, you can see it in anatomical images, but there is nothing that you can detect at least at the resolution of, uh, or at the, you know, uh, the information content of today's anatomical images, there is nothing we can detect. So the general idea uh, that uh, emerges, of course, ultimately that these are circuit problems. So this is, uh, you know, maybe I didn't make that uh, link so uh, clear, but the concept that these may be circuit problems has driven the Human Connectome Project and uh, uh, to, to aim for defining uh, circuits. And uh, so, uh, of course, I don't, we don't have results yet to show you about uh, neuropsychiatric disorders um, from the Human Connectome Project. It's a normative database. But as I had mentioned, that there will be, uh, you know, there are data being collected. Um, some of them, in fact, are being collected at 7 Tesla for various uh, orders, disorders. And then we, you know, we will see. Um, the hope is that we will be able to say, uh huh, yes. Such and such circuits are affected uh, in such and such disease. Of course, that doesn't necessarily give you a cure, but it gives you a step forward in terms of uh, thinking about how we can deal with those. And can we manipulate those circuits? Can we intervene? I mean, uh, today, you know, more and more we are sticking electrodes, or we are. We've uh, heard in yesterday's, you know, we uh, we can uh, ablate regions of the brain and modulate uh, circuit activity. So uh, if we know more about the circuits that are dysfunctional, maybe we'll be able to do so. But uh, circuits, uh, when, we, when 